Hello, I'm Dr. DeBellis, and today I'd like to talk to you about functional neuroanatomy. We're going to talk about what the different parts of the nervous system are. We're going to talk about the different structures that make them up. And then we're going to talk about what their role is in human behavior. The central nervous system consists of the brain and the spinal cord. We usually abbreviate central nervous system as CNS. The peripheral nervous system consists of all the parts of the nervous system found outside the skull and the spinal column. And we usually abbreviate peripheral nervous system as uh, uh, PNS. If you look over there on the side, that's a diagram that I did of the mid-sagittal section through the brain and the spinal cord. So that would be a, a diagram of the central nervous system. Now, in the central nervous system, collections of cell bodies, or soma, again, these can be gray matter, um, they're called nuclei, whereas collections of the cell bodies are called ganglia in the peripheral nervous system. Now, collections of axons, and again, axons are actually going to be lighter in color because of all that myelin. It has a whitish color since it's a phospholipid. But collections of axons are called tracts in the central nervous system, but they're called nerves in the peripheral nervous system. So if we look behind the eyeballs, we'll find that we have cranial nerves, cranial nerves extending from the eyeball, then they go into the cranium, and eventually they cross over at the optic chiasm. And then after that point, they're no longer called optic nerves, they're called optic tracts. Um, that's because they're no longer comprised of peripheral nervous system. They then become part of the central nervous system. So these are going to be some helpful terms to for you to understand what you learn about neuroanatomy. Now the peripheral nervous system consists of nerves or bundles of axons and it has two systems, the somatic and autonomic nervous systems. The somatic nervous system, uh, also called somatic nerves, are uh, connected to the spinal cord and the cranial nerves connect to the brain. Now the autonomic nervous system primarily controls glands and internal organs. It has a sympathetic and parasympathetic division. Here's a helpful diagram showing uh, the different parts of the nervous system. Over on the left, right below nervous system, you see central nervous system, the brain and spinal cord. Over on the right, we have peripheral nervous system. Um, now the central nervous system, again, you can see it's comprised of the brain and spinal cord, whereas the peripheral nervous system is comprised of somatic nervous system and autonomic nervous systems. And the somatic nervous system is comprised of cranial nerves and spinal nerves, and the autonomic nervous system is comprised of the sympathetic division, the parasympathetic division, and the enteric nervous system. So there are 31 pairs of spinal nerves. In each spinal nerve is the fusion of two distinct branches or roots. So we have the dorsal root and the ventral root. The dorsal root here is in the back, and that's where incoming sensory information arrives at the spinal cord. It goes in through the back. So information comes into the back of the spinal cord. And then out the front, that's where motor information is directed out of the spinal cord. This is the ventral root. So the dorsal root carries sensory information from the body to the spinal cord, whereas the ventral root carries motor information from the spinal cord to the muscles. This is similar to the brain. If you think about it, the brain sends a lot of incoming information, it projects it directly to the occipital lobes, which are in the back of the brain. And the front of the brain is more involved in motor functioning. So kind of like the dorsal and the ventral roots of the spinal cord. We also have 12 pairs of cranial nerves. So you have, uh, um, you have two of each of these. I'm going to refer to it like you have one. Uh, the olfactory nerve is cranial nerve one. It's important. Um, it senses smell. Um, cranial nerve 2, optic nerve, is important for vision. Cranial nerve 3 is the oculomotor nerve for eye movement. Um, 
cranial nerve 4 is the trochlear nerve, which is important for eye movement as well. Cranial nerve 5 um, is the trigeminal, which has both sensory and motor functions involved um, in chewing and sensation. Now, cranial nerve 6, the abducens, is involved in eye movement, kind of like cranial nerves 3 and 4. Cranial nerve 7 um, is involved in both sensory and motor aspects of the face. So um, cranial nerve 8, the vestibulocochlear, is a sensory cranial nerve that's important for sensing what we hear, auditory information. Cranial nerve 5 is important for, um, it's the glossopharyngeal nerve. Um, Number 10 is the vagus, which is important for sensory and motor functioning in the pharynx and larynx. 11 is a spinal accessory nerve, which plays a motor role in both um, neck and shoulder muscles. And finally, cranial nerve 12, the hypoglossal, plays a, a role in motor functioning of the tongue. And if you look over here, you can you can see a brain stem. We're looking from the posterior aspect. We're looking from the back. And as you can see, these are all going to be um, cranial nerves here, originating from the brain stem. The nuclei are actually buried inside the brain stem. And, um, but there are 12 pairs of the cranial nerves. Now, when we look at the spinal cord, we have four divisions of the spinal cord. The top um, is the cervical, and the very bottom one is sacral. And in between, we have the thoracic and lumbar divisions. Um, and we, we actually have seven segments for the cervical, which innervates the muscles of the neck and diaphragm. Whereas the thoracic has 12 innervations, which uh, innervate the chest and upper limbs. The lumbar has five, which innervate the trunk, and finally the sacral innervates the lower extremities. The autonomic nervous system spans the central and peripheral nervous systems. Um, groups of neurons called autonomic ganglia are located outside the central nervous system. Preganglionic neurons run from the central nervous system to the autonomic ganglia and postganglionic neurons run from the autonomic ganglia to targets in the body. So the autonomic nervous system has three major divisions, the sympathetic or the fight and flight division, the parasympathetic or the rest and digest division, and finally the enteric nervous system which innervates the, the gut. Um, so the sympathetic nervous system um, it's a sympathetic chain which runs along each side uh, of the spinal column and prepares the body for action. We refer to this as the fight or flight response. So if you're walking to class and you saw a lion chasing you, your uh, blood pressure, your heart rate would increase, your bronchial tubes would dilate so that you could take in more oxygen, which you could then pump through your dilated peripheral blood vessels to your muscles. Your pupils would dilate. Certain functions would cease to occur. This is not a good time to be ovulating, and it's not really that important whether you're fully digesting your food. You can do those things later by the campfire, if there is a later, assuming that the lion does not catch you. Um, so this is called the fight or flight response. Research has shown that maybe the fight or flight response is a little bit different for females than it is males, um, which has given rise to this idea of what we call the tender befriend response. Uh, an argument can be made that from an evolutionary standpoint, it might not be that adaptive for mothers to have a fight or flight response. It might be um, more essential to their survival and the survival of their, their young if a woman has a tender befriend response. And research has shown that this is probably the case. Um, now the opposite of the sympathetic response is the parasympathetic. The parasympathetic nervous system has preganglionic neurons that arise in the cranial nerves 
whose activation is often in opposition to sympathetic activity. For example, the heart rate is slowed by the parasympathetic nervous system, but increased by the sympathetic nervous system. Um, there are two different amine neurotransmitters that are used for these systems. We're going to talk about this in great deal uh, of detail when we get to chapter four. But sympathetic neurons produce norepinephrine, which is also called noradrenaline, and it accelerates activity and leads to the sympathetic response. Now the parasymp parasympathetic neurons produce acetylcholine. Acetylcholine hits nicotonic receptors. Nicotonic sounds familiar. Maybe you're thinking of nicotine. Yes, if you think about it, uh, a cigarette is reported to have relaxing effects for a cigarette user. It's because it's stimulating these same nicotonic receptors that acetylcholine stimulates during the rest and digest response. So we here we have the cortex of the brain. Now we're going to talk about the central nervous system. Um, we can divide the central nervous system into the brain and the spinal cord. And the first thing that I would like to do is point out that this is the cortex. This area outside here is the cortex. Cortex means bark. It's the outer three millimeters of covering. It's all wrinkled up here um, and it covers all the other structures that are inside of it. Um, and we have two hemispheres. We have a left hemisphere and we have a right hemisphere. And each hemisphere has four lobes. Up front, we have the frontal lobe. There's the frontal lobe. The frontal lobe is really important for movement. It's really important for abstract reasoning, for executive functioning, for movement of the eyes. It's really important for problem solving. Um, the temporal lobe is over here. If you think of this as a big mitten, it would be the thumb of the mitten. Temporal lobes are really important for um, what we hear, what we smell. They're extremely important for um, comprehension and emotions as well. In the back, we have the occipital lobes. Occipital lobes are super important for visual information. And as human beings, we have a tendency to be very visual in the way that we learn. When we have uh, information coming in various sensory modalities, we often favor visual information. And the field of cognitive neuroscience has shown us that we favor visual information so much that it's almost to the exclusion of other information, like auditory information. And finally, we have the parietal lobe. The parietal lobe is really important for somatosensory information. There's a topographic map of the body here. It's also important for attention. Um, we're going to talk in more detail about these areas. This is called a mid-sagittal section, and I want to talk about Papes and McLean. Papes and McLean came up with this idea of um, Papes triune. It's the idea that at its core down here, we have the reptile brain. This is the reptile brain. The reptile brain does reptile things. It's in control of breathing. It's in control of blood pressure and vital functions, things that a reptile would do. Um, on top of that, we have what's called the old mammalian brain, and it's responsible for things that all mammals do, things that dogs and cats do. 
For instance, unlike reptiles, mammals actually can regulate their own body temperature. They nurse their young. Um, they do things that reptiles don't do. And then finally, we have the neomammalian brain, or the new mammalian brain. And this area, which is going to be called the neocortex, it's really important for functions that are um, uniquely human. There are some things human beings do that animals just don't do. For instance, sitting around a, a board with pieces of wood and moving them and working up the heart rate of a marathon runner. This is something that chess players do. Um, so being able to think abstractly, as abstractly as we do, um, these are things that are unique to human beings, um, and these are things that are regulated by the neomammalian brain. And this is the idea of Pape's triune, is that our mammalian brain is on top of the reptilian brain, and we have this neomammalian brain, which is on top of the old mammalian brain. So the central nervous system, as I said before, it's comprised of the brain and the spinal cord. And the brain has two cerebral hemispheres, which each have four lobes. The cerebral cortex is the outermost layer of the cerebral hemispheres. A gyrus is a ridged or raised portion of the convoluted brain surface. We have all these bumps everywhere. These are gyri. Um, a sulcus or a fissure is a furrow of the convoluted brain surface. Uh, so um, technically a fissure is deeper than a sulcus, but for the purpose of, of this course, we can just think of them as indentations, uh, whereas the gyri are the raised um, ridges. Now, there are landmark boundaries we need to be familiar with when we're trying to locate parts of the brain. The first is the sylvian fissure, and the sylvian fissure runs up along the top of the temporal lobe, and then we have the central sulcus. The central sulcus actually divides the frontal lobe from the parietal lobe. So this is what we're going to call the central sulcus, and this is what we're going to call the sylvian fissure. Uh, the, these are going to be landmark structures that are going to be useful so that we can identify where we're at in the brain. So the cerebral hemispheres, again, we have two of them. Each one has four lobes. The frontal lobes are important for movement, complex thought, and behavior, whereas the parietal are important for sensory processing and attention. The occipital Again, the occipital are going to be here in the back. So you can think of the frontal as being anything up above and anterior to that line. And here's the parietal here. Everything in this area. And then the occipital is here at the back. It's really involved and visual processing. It has a key role in visual processing. In fact, it sends two streams of information. This top one is the where stream, and this bottom stream is the what stream. There's the temporal lobe here. It's really important for auditory processing, memory, identification, smell, plays a really important part in emotions as well. And we're going to talk in more detail about this throughout the course of this class. Again, here are those lobes in a little bit more detail here. This is frontal up here, parietal right here, occipital here, Finally, temporal right here. So maybe if you can try to draw one. I think of it as being kind of like a mitten. Again, the temporal lobe, if you think of the T, maybe means temporal or thumb. Maybe the 
F for frontal or fingers. Um, now down here we have something called the cerebellum. Cerebellum means little brain. And the cerebellum is really important for balance and movement and proprioception. We're going to talk about this in more detail. But it's not actually considered one of the lobes. Now this is called a mid-sagittal section. Mid meaning that it's in the middle. And sagittal refers to the fact that there's a slice down the center. Um, and here we have the medulla. We're going to talk about this in great, great detail. It's, it's involvement in vital functions such as respiration and heart rate. Um, here's the pons we're going to talk about in great detail. It means bridge. It connects the spinal cord, the cerebellum, and the cortex. Um, this is the cerebellum here. The cerebellum is really important for movement, proprioception, and balance. We have this hollowed out area here as well. Um, this empty space isn't really empty. It's actually got cerebral spinal fluid in it. And we will refer to it as a ventricle. This is actually the fourth ventricle. And it separates the brain stem from the cerebellum. And here we have what we call the pituitary gland. The pituitary gland is, the, is referred to as the master gland because it plays such a key role in the production of hormones. We have a little area here called the anterior commissure, which connects the two hemispheres. But this area right here, the corpus callosum, and I'm going to circle it in red. Four different divisions of it. We have the splenium, the isthmus, the um, genu, and the rostrum. They're all parts of this, this corpus callosum that connects the two hemispheres. Uh, as you can see, it's white in color because it's mostly myelin. Uh, so it's mostly axons, these huge collections of axons. This structure right here. You can't really see that well, but it's like a big egg. This is called the thalamus. It's the central switchboard that all information heading to the cortex actually has to go through, and it gets directed. This is what we call the midbrain right here. And we're going to divide this into two areas. The tegmentum right here. This is the tectum. It's comprised of two different parts here. The superior colliculi. The superior colliculi is really important for visual alarm information. And the inferior colliculi is really important for auditory alarm information. So maybe if you're, uh, if you're in a silent place and you hear a loud sound that sounds threatening, maybe the backfiring of a tailpipe, it's going to activate the inferior colliculi. If you see something alarming that activates your sympathetic response, perhaps the superior colliculi are being activated. This right here is called the pineal gland. The pineal gland is really important for a production site for melatonin, which is involved in sleep cycles. Um, this up here is referred to as the Hypothalamus. The hypothalamus is known for being responsible for the four F's. So I'm trying to draw an F there. The four F's being fight, flight, feed, or fornicate. So again, here's the cerebellum, which is important for motor functioning, fine movement, refinement, and uh, balance and proprioception. Um, up here, all of this gray matter with all the convolutions, this is what we're going to call the cortex. And it's a three millimeter layer of cortex that covers all the white matter structures. Um, 
And this part right here is a part of interest. Uh, it's been heavily involved in different neurological syndromes as well as psychiatric conditions. This is called the cingulate gyrus here. And the cingulate gyrus wraps around the corpus callosum. Um, so those are some areas of the brain. Here we have uh, uh, this dark area right here is another hollowed out area. Um, as you know, it's not full of air, it's full of cerebral spinal fluid. This is actually uh, one of the ventricles that you're looking at right here. So these are some of the structures that we're going to be talking about in this chapter. Now the sensory strip is a strip of cortex behind the central sulcus. Or I'm sorry, behind the um, central sulcus here. Uh, so the sensory strip would be right here, so it would be in the parietal lobe. Um, we oftentimes abbreviate it S1. Um, and it's important for touch. There's actually a topographic map of the body here. And for this topographic map of the body, we actually have representation from the face. It's about here. And then the hand. And then above that is the arm. And then if you wrap around to the inside, we actually end up having the legs and sensation of the genitalia, actually. Um, so that's called the sensory cortex. I'm going to switch colors here. And we will use um, blue for the motor cortex. So the motor cortex is important for controlling the muscles. It sends messages to the muscles that help them to contract. So it's called the motor cortex, and we will abbreviate that in our sensory processing chapter as M1. It's the primary motor cortex, but basically it's got all the neurons that actually make their way down to the muscles to operate the muscles. And again, it has a topographic mapping where the the face is right here, and notice how big the face area is. It's huge. The hand area is as well, too. Well, that's probably because being able to manipulate our fingers and our hands and our face are some of the most important things that we do. If we cannot chew our food properly, if we cannot uh, use our hands, that's going to have more of a, uh, a, a effect on us than other parts of our body. But that's the motor cortex. And again, the corpus callosum is a bundle of axons that connects the two cerebral hemispheres. And we can't see it right now because it's on the inside of the brain. It's, uh, it's buried underneath the cortex, so we have no way of viewing it with this brain. Now, there are two colors of brain tissue. We have white matter and gray matter. White matter consists most, mostly of axons with white myelin sheaths. Um, and white matter typically relays information. Gray matter, on the other hand, contains more cell bodies and dendrites, um, which lack myelin, and uh, gray matter perceives and processes information. Um, and then we also have something called reticular matter, which we find in the brainstem, for instance, which is a mixture. It's kind of a light gray matter. It's a combination of the two. Now, if we're talking about orientations of the brain, if we're looking at a brain scan, we have to know if we're looking at it from the front to back or if we're looking side to side. Um, we have these terms. The terms are sagittal, coronal, and horizontal planes, and they tell us the orientation of the brain. A sagittal plane... Um, is a plane of the brain where you're looking at the brain and on one side you have the very front and on the other side you have the very back. We call it sagittal because sagittal refers to an archer and as you know archers pull the string back along the sagittal plane. Coronal planes, coronal refers to crown, they divide the brain into a front and back kind of like a crown. 
And then finally, the horizontal plane divides the brain into an upper and a lower part. Whenever I'm showing you a brain scan, I will oftentimes refer to it as either sagittal, coronal, or horizontal. Some terms I want to use for whenever we do look at brain scans, um, some terminology about um, reference and relationship spatially. Medial means toward the middle when we talk about the brain. Lateral means toward the outside. Ipsilateral means on the same side. Contralateral means opposite side. This is going to be important to know because each hemisphere controls the contralateral side of the body. It's a very interesting phenomenon. Anterior rostral refers to the beak end, whereas posterior or caudal means the tail end. Proximal means near the center, and distal means toward the periphery. Dorsal means toward the back, and ventral means toward the belly. And to describe the flow of information, afferent means information that's carried to a region of interest, whereas efferent means information carried away. So sensory fibers would be called afferent, whereas motor fibers would be called efferent. I made this chart so you'd have an overview of the parts of the human nervous system. So we talked about earlier, we have the central nervous system and the peripheral nervous system. The peripheral nervous system is comprised of the somatic and autonomic divisions. The somatic being the spinal and cranial nerves, whereas the autonomic is the sympathetic and parasympathetic. We also have the central nervous system. The central nervous system is comprised of the brain and the spinal cord. We would have a view through a spinal column. When it comes to the brain, we can divide it into the forebrain, the midbrain, and the hindbrain. These are not the same as Pape's triune when we were talking about the reptilian, uh, the mammalian, and the neomammalian brain. These are not the same. There's overlap, but they don't neatly. Um, uh, fit together. They're not the same thing. They're similar. But the hindbrain is comprised of the pons, the cerebellum, and medulla. Um, the midbrain is, is comprised of the tectum and tegmentum. And the forebrain is comprised of the cere cerebral cortex, the basal ganglia, the limbic system, the thalamus, and the hypothalamus. So I'll need you to be familiar with this chart. This is a really helpful tool to get a good overview of the terrain that we're going to now explore. The basal ganglia includes the caudate nucleus, the putamen, the globus pallidus, and the substantia nigra. There's also a other part of it called the subthalamic nucleus that's actually not in there. But the basal ganglia are very important for motor functioning affect, cognition, and eye movement. Um, you might want to use the acronym MACE for those functions, but it's really important for action selection. Um, and when people have disorders that affect the basal ganglia, oftentimes we find their movement is disrupted. Sometimes there's too much movement, sometimes there's too little movement, but here we actually have um, a picture that I did of the basal ganglia. This part right here is what we're going to call the putamen. Then this part right here is the caudate nucleus. Caudate again meaning tail. And it does look kind of like a tail. If this was an organism here, I would assume that we would call that the tail. Now buried within the putamen Kind of like the uh, yolk and an egg. Buried in there, we have the globus pallidus. And then down here, we have the subthalamic nucleus and then the substantia nigra, which is uh, right here. The substantia nigra is really important. It's been implemented into conditions such as Parkinson's disease, where the pars compacta doesn't produce enough um, dopamine. We're going to talk about this in great detail 
um, in later chapters. Now I said that having disruption in the basal ganglia can cause too much movement or it can cause too little. This can be kind of confusing. Um, the basal ganglia has two um, pathways. There's a hyperkinetic pathway that amplifies movements, whereas there's a hypokinetic pathway which reduces movements. Um, so the hyperkinetic is probably impacted by something that's going to lead to Parkinson's disease, whereas the hypokinetic pathway, which reduces movements, it's going to be impacted by disorders that uh, lead to increased movements, such as Huntington's chorea, where there's a dance-like um, motion that an individual has because of excessive movement. But the basal ganglia has these two pathways, the hyperkinetic and the hypokinetic. Depending on which pathway is affected, there can be too little or too much movement. The limbic system. So the limbic system was once called the rhinencephalon. Rhinencephalon, of course, meaning nose brain. Uh, because it was noticed that rats had this and that it played a key role in their um, sense of olfaction and their memory and other areas. Um, at some point, though, we noted that human beings also have a limbic system. And, um, human beings don't actually use their nose as much as rats do to navigate and understand their environment. So, the name limbic system was proposed instead. And this is similar to Pape's um, mammalian brain. There are up to 21 structures that are classified as limbic structures. Um, the most well-known is the amygdala, which plays a prominent role in fear, anxiety, anger, as well as emotional memories. The hippocampus one of the best understood, one of the best studied at least, uh, structures in the brain plays a very important role in memory consolidation, um, especially in spatial navigation. You're probably familiar that in Alzheimer's, the hippocampi are um, impacted uh, preferentially, especially in the initial stages. And one of the behaviors you often find with individuals with Alzheimer's disease is getting lost. Because the hippocampi are atrophying, ability to navigate through space is hampered by poor memory, poor spatial navigation. The olfactory bulbs are really important for smell. They're part of the limbic system. There we have some another schematic here where we show different parts of the limbic system. Uh, this right here is the hippocampi. I'm going to use that color there. Okay, so these right here, are, this is uh, one of the hippocampi here. Hippocampus means uh, seahorse, because if you do a cross section through it, it looks kind of like a seahorse. Um, and then this right here is called the fornix. It actually wraps around and it connects the hippocampi to the septal nuclei and the mammillary bodies, which are up here, and they play an important role in, in um, connecting the frontal lobe, lobes with uh, the um, limbic system. Um, we have the stria terminalis, the stria lateralis as well. Um, Here's the amygdala on the inside here. The amygdala, again, is an important part of the limbic system. Here's that olfactory bulb, which again is also a key part of the um, limbic system. Here we have the basal forebrain, which is an honorary member of the limbic system. And then finally, we're going to also have parts of the thalamus such as the dorsal medial thalamus. Again, the thalamus plays a prominent role in incoming information, uh, directing it to the cortex.
Here's another picture. It looks a lot different, but it's actually the same structures here. Um, there we have a hippocampus. This one doesn't look quite as prominent as the other one. Uh, this one's probably more to scale, to be honest with you. But here's the hippocampus. There's that fornix that wraps around. Don't worry about the orange structure. That's the stria terminalis. And I'm not going to talk that much about that for this lecture. But as you can see, that fornix wraps around, and it goes to these little structures here called the mammillary bodies. They uh, help to connect uh, the frontal lobes with the limbic system. They tend to atrophy when an individual has a, a Korsakoff's dementia. We find that they atrophy, and that's probably associated with a symptom we call confabulation. Confabulation is whenever memory uh, is compromised, but the individual doesn't realize it, so they fill in the gaps of their story with false information. They're not really aware that it's false. They're just filling in the missing information. Um, and here's the cingulate gyrus as well, uh, which is another part of the limbic system. Here are the amygdalae, which again are really important for uh, anger, uh, fear, negative emotions. The thalamus is the switchboard which directs information to, to the appropriate areas of the cortex. So. When information goes in, or uh, in, sensory information makes it to the brain, the first stop is going to be the thalamus. And then the thalamus is going to direct information to the appropriate part of the cortex. Interesting thing is, when information goes into the brain, such as, oh, geez, let me think, your grandmother, that information is not directed to a particular neuron. There's not a grandmother neuron that holds the image of your grandmother. The visual information goes to the occipital lobe. The feel of grandma is going to go to the parietal lobe, where the sensory cortex is. The smell of grandma is going to go to the piriform cortex. The sound of grandma is going to make it to the auditory cortex. So the parts of grandma are going to make it into all different parts of the cortex. Um, now it's fascinating how whenever we conjure up the concept of grandma, it all comes together. Um, this is called the um, connectionist paradox. Uh, the fact that it's all connected um, and we, uh, even though we store all the different pieces in different parts of the brain. Now the hypothalamus, again, is important for fight, flight, feed, and fornicate. The mammillary bodies are important for memory. Um, whenever they're atrophied, this can lead to confabulation, a symptom we see in alcoholism. And then the anterior cingulate uh, is really important for attention and pain. We also have the septum, which inhibits aggression, the ventral tegmental uh, and nucleus accumbens, which release dopamine. They're important for reward circuits. We also have the prefrontal cortex. Um, the best predictor of prefrontal cortex is the size of social networks. The, the prefrontal cortex is really important for a lot of things. For instance, it's important that it looks like it evolved so that we could engage in novel strategies for defending ourselves and attracting mates. It also seems like it's important for um, utilizing tools, which would be very important for cutting meat or, or using as a weapon. Um, it also is really important for um, helping us to have large social networks. Um, and as you know, in life, the size of our social network oftentimes uh, is a protective factor as well as a, an opportunity to advance yourself, to get more jobs, have more educational opportunities. Um, 
as the adage goes, it's not always what you know. Sometimes it's who you know. The amygdala fugal pathways are connections between the hippocampus and amygdala. We're going to talk about these uh, when the amygdala hijacks the hippocampus. Uh, this is the pathway that is probably overly active. We also have the fornix, which is from the mammillary bodies to the hippocampus, which we saw earlier. The medial forebrain bundle is important because it's involved in the reward system. Um, and the striatum analis goes from the amygdala to the hypothalamus. The mammillothalamic tract goes from the mammillary bodies to the thalamus. And the ventral tegmentum um, is another reward circuit. Now, when we talk about the midbrain systems, we have the superior colliculi and the inferior colliculi. So, the superior colliculi, which we're going to put in red, those would be there's one on the right side and there's one on the left side as well. So, that's the superior colliculus. And whenever you see something alarming, it activates this. This is an emergency alert system that activates your sympathetic response. Um, I remember one time I was reading at like four in the morning and no one was awake. And as I'm reading my book, my cat's tail actually bumped me, went right in front of my eye. I didn't realize the cat was actually sleeping on the back of the sofa because he was so quiet. As a result, I had a sudden burst and um, this was the activation of the superior colliculus. Now the inferior colliculi, and for the severe, so for the um, inferior colliculi, I'm going to use blue. Um, the inferior colliculi process auditory alarm information, such as the backfiring of a tailpipe, which can also activate our sympathetic nervous system. Um, collectively, we call the um, superior and inferior colliculi the tectum. Um, so in the midbrain, here's where our um, tectum would be. So the structures we just looked at, um, the superior colliculi up top, the inferior down below. We also have the tegmentum. The tegmentum here is really important because it produces neurotransmitters. And the neurotransmitters end up going all throughout the brain. But the tegmentum is a major production site for neurotransmitters. Now the reticular formation, on the other hand, uh, consists of the a set of nuclei here that are in the brain stem. And what these do, they're involved with levels of, of arousal. So they're involved in sleep, arousal, temperature control. We actually have these different um, levels of arousal. For instance, um, and this, these reticular struct, the reticular formation starts from down in the medulla oblongata, and makes its way up in the brain stem to just a little bit above the pons, but we have different levels of alert of um, arousal. Alert is when we have open eyes, somebody's looking at you and responding appropriately. Now, lethargic, and sometimes I see lethargic when I teach my 8 a.m. class. Um, individuals who are drowsy, but they can open up their eyes and look at you when you call on them in class, and they can respond to questions. Um, hopefully they don't fall back to sleep, but if they're lethargic, this is something that could happen. Obtuned is when an individual is difficult to arouse. A uh, loud shout or vigorous shake will um, lead them to open their eyes and look at you, but they respond slowly and they're confused. Stuporous is when somebody arouses from sleep only after painful stimuli. Um, sometimes they use the Glasgow Coma Scale. Uh, to, to measure um, whether somebody responds to pain, for instance. And finally, comatose is an individual who's unarousable. They have no response to any stimuli.
Now the hindbrain is comprised of the cerebellum, which again is important for movement, proprioception, and balance. The medulla, which is important for breathing and heart rate. And then finally, the pons. Pons means bridge. What the pons is important for is it's a, a bridge that connects the cortex up top with the cerebellum and the spinal cord. So it's a bridge that connects them. The cerebellum is involved in motor coordination, memory, attention. We have a paleo, neo, and archi cerebellum. We're going to talk about those in more detail when we talk about motor functioning. But it's involved in motor coordination, memory. Um, it also has a, a role in cognition as well. Um, now the pons, on the other hand, it's connected to the cerebellum, contains motor and sensory nuclei, and again, it connects the cerebellum with the spinal cord and the cerebral cortex. Here we have a, um, the anterior view here where we see the pons. It's orange. Within the medulla, multiple cell groups regulate vital functions, including heart rate, digestion, respiration, blood pressure, coughing, and vomiting. And drug overdose usually affects medulla and stops respiration. We also have an area, a circumventricular region, a place where the blood-brain barrier is not very strong. It's called the area postrema, and it has reduced blood-brain barrier, uh, which initiates vomiting in response to toxins. It's right next to the cerebellum as well. Here we have a mid-sagittal section of the brain. Um, now the brain and spinal cord are surrounded by three protective membranes called the meninges. Um, the acronym PAD is really useful for remembering them. We have the dura mater, which is the toughest outermost sheet. Um, inside of it we have the arachnoid membrane, which lies between two, um, the two others, the pia and the dura. It's called arachnoid because of its wispy appearance, and it's filled with cerebral spinal fluid. And then finally, we have the pia mater, which is the delicate innermost layer. looks like cheesecloth. It's right on top of the cerebral cortex. Sometimes people can actually have a buildup of blood in between the different layers. We would call this a hematoma. You can have subdural or subarachnoid or epidural hematomas, and this can cause pressure in the brain. Whenever you have the pressure in the brain, one of the safeguards against disrupted functioning is the ventricular system. It's a series of chambers filled with cerebral spinal fluid. And here we have uh, the ventricular system. Now that orange area in there is actually what we call the choroid plexus. What it does is it actually produces cerebral spinal fluid, about a pint a day, and then it goes from the lateral ventricles. We have two lateral ventricles. There's uh, one here, there's one on the other side, and then it makes its way to the third ventricle. We call that ventricle three, and then finally to the fourth. And then this uh, cerebral spinal fluid will either make its way down the spinal cord um, through the four foramen of Magendi, or it will actually make its way back up into the meninges through the foramen of Lushka. But uh, the ventricular system acts as a shock absorber, uh, but it also provides an exchange medium between blood and the brain. Now the lateral ventricle in each hemisphere extends into all four lobes, and it's lined with the choroid plexus, which again, it was orange in that in that picture that I, I drew that we just looked at. Um, but it's a membrane that produces cerebral spinal fluid. And the cerebral spinal fluid flows into the third ventricle, then to the fourth ventricle, uh, where it exits to circulate over the brain and the spinal cord. This is how it would look here. You can see if uh, you put this uh, 
the vent ventricles if you uh, put them on a mid-sagittal section of the brain here. But again, um, cerebral spinal fluid is produced by the choroid plexus, which is orange here, and it makes its way to the third ventricle. Then it actually takes this little narrow passage that we call the psoe and aqueduct takes it to the fourth ventricle. And then from the fourth ventricle, it's going to go down into the spinal cord, where it's going to be redistributed back up into the meninges, where it produces, where it serves as padding for the meninges, the dura mater, the pia mater, and the lip. two lateral ventricles. Altogether, remember that you have four ventricles. Now the carotid arteries are the major, major arteries of the brain. The internal carotid artery branches into the anterior and middle cerebral arteries, and the vertebral arteries enter the skull and form the basilar artery, which gives rise to the posterior cerebral arteries. There's a diagram of these. Um, now the circle of Willis is a structure formed by the major cerebral arteries. And stroke is caused by the rupture or blockage of blood vessels, leading to insufficient blood supply. The blood-brain barrier is the result of higher resistance in brain capillaries that restrict passage of large molecules. We're going to use brain imaging to study different conditions such as stroke. So, this is called a CT scan, computerized tomography. It's a measure of uh, X-ray absorption at several positions around the head, and it maps tissue density. We call it structural imaging, not functional imaging. Structural imaging tells us whether the structures are intact. Functional tells us how well they're functioning. Magnetic resonance imaging is another structural imaging technique. Strong magnets cause protons in the brain tissue uh, to line up in parallel, and then a pulse of radio waves knocks portion, protons all over, and the protons reconfigure, and in the process they actually emit radio waves that differ by tissue density. And the MRI tells us which um, tissues are denser, which ones have the density of liquid versus lipids. We also have positron emission tomography, or PET scans. This is not a structural scan. This is functional. It gives us images of brain activity. It uses radioactive chemicals injected into the bloodstream and then maps their destination by the radioactive emissions. It identifies which brain regions contribute to specific functions. So it can tell us which parts of the brain are active when we engage in certain types of activities. Here we have a PET scan. The one up top is a normal individual. The one below is an individual with Alzheimer's disease. Areas of the highest glucose metabolism are actually going to be red uh, here and white. If you look down here, you don't have as much. It means that there are parts of the brain that are not as active. And this is one of the the causes for the symptoms that we see in Alzheimer's disease, the cognitive symptoms. We also have functional MRI, which is both structural and functional, and it measures changes in brain metabolism, allowing us to note active brain areas and infer how networks of the brain structures collaborate. So imaging can overcome these limitations of other methods of assessment. And one question that can be addressed is the state of consciousness of people in comas, for instance. Brain areas in such people can show activation when individuals in a coma are actually prompted. And here you have a list of different questions that you can look over as part of a study guide. Thank you very much, and next time we're going to talk about the action potential.